Life Over Coffee, Conversations for Transformation. Hello, everybody. This is Rick Thomas, and we are doing Life Over Coffee. Thank you so much for joining me. I want to share with you a conversation that I have with pastors on somewhat of a regular basis. I think maybe the best way for me to get into this is to talk about the demographics that make up a local church and there are four four basic and general categories demographics of people that come to uh, your church meeting on any given sunday morning first of all you have the visitors those are the tire kickers those are the people that have heard about your church they're checking it out maybe they're coming Uh, because someone invited them. These are the people that you want in your church. You always want people visiting and checking you out. And then you have regular attendees. These are the individuals who have been coming to your church for a while. They have yet to commit. They are not members of the church, uh, but they like uh, what the church provides. They love the preaching. They come for different reasons. Maybe they like the amenities of the church. Uh, and so they're somewhere in between a visitor and, and a member. And so they're what I would call regular attendees. And then you have a third group of people. These are folks who have signed on the dotted line. They have become members. They have made a commitment to uh, the local church, but yet they are not engaged. Uh, They're not participating in the various ministries of the church in the sense that they're using their gifts. They're using their strengths in a way to go and make disciples using the local church as a context for their disciple making. And so I call these non-engaged members. And then you have a fourth demographic. These are the engaged members. They have gone through the entire process. They they began as visitors. They uh, were regular attendees as they continued to kick the tires. They became members, and then they found their niche within that local body, and they want to serve that local church. And so these people make up more of the leadership quality, the leadership fabric of the church. Now, in many of these churches, the visitors, the regular attendees, the non-engaged members, they are more, more numerous than those who are doing the ministry's work. And when this happens, the church's infrastructure And the infrastructure are the leaders. And when I say leaders, I'm not talking about just the pastors or the pastors in the small group leaders or the elder team, them too, but also these engaged members. And so that is the leadership fabric of the church. And that group is much smaller than the visitors, the regular attendees, and the non-engaged members. And whenever you have a church to where the leadership fabric, the infrastructure is smaller than this other number, well, you do have a you have an immune system problem. It's like our own bodies. If our immune system is not able to comprehend and compensate for the things that come into our body, well, we will be in a weakened position. We will be open and susceptible to disease. And that's what happens in a local church. When the infrastructure is much smaller than the visitors who are coming, the regular attendees, those who are members, but yet they are not engaged in the church. Uh, Some people call this the 80-20 rule, and when that's true, I mean, we can make it a principle like the 80-20 rule and say this is what we should expect. Well, if that's what you expect, that's what you will get, and what will happen, again, uh, your church will be open to burnout, uh, open to a lot of frustration because uh, you're constantly trying to accommodate Uh, the visitors, the attendees, the non-engaged members, and it just weakens the church infrastructurally and it weakens the church overall. Thus, every church needs to wrestle with how to identify future leaders and then how to develop them, hoping to move them along through the process to where a visitor comes into the local church They become regular attendees, praise God. They become members, hallelujah. 
but you want to move them to this fourth level, this next level. And so you want to identify them and then have a plan to develop them so that they become part of the discipleship making community. What you don't want is for people to come in and just stay in one of these three demos that I have outlined and they become more consumers of the local church. And so I want to talk about that in this episode. And if you want to find the episode, please go to 457. I titled it An Effective Equipping Model for the Church. And I trust that this will benefit you. As a church member, I hope it will envision you. If you are an attendee of a local church, if you are a non-engaged member, may may the Lord use this episode to just give you that 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 loving nudge to find your place in your local church so that you can do more than just being a consumer of the church, but you can actually be coming alongside all the leadership structure and be a disciple maker within your sphere of strength, the gifts that God has given you. If your local church leadership team, if we can serve you and help in any way, and I'll talk more about that at the end, then we would love to do that because we want to see the infrastructure of local churches to mature and to grow. That is my heart. Uh, I have a high view of the local church. I believe outside of the family, the local church is the number one context for us to go and tell the world about Jesus and then also to bring in those new converts and to mature and develop them so they can go into all the world and tell folks about Jesus. And so the local church outside of the family is the number one context for this dynamic of fulfilling the Great Commission to happen. And the reason I say outside of the family, the family is number one because the family, the family unit is what makes up the local church. And so our family should be doing this. Every husband and wife and child should be growing uh, into Christ-like maturity and then coming together inside a local church and then all the families, family units working together to magnify the fame of Christ throughout the world. And so in the church demo, you have visitors. Those are folks who are checking out the church, okay? Then you have the attendees, those who attend but they are not contributing to the ministry. And then you have members. Those are, they, they like the church uh, and they become members. They just don't want to be tire kickers anymore. They don't want to be in that big category of regular attendees, and so they become church members. But there is one more place for them. They need to move into the leadership fabric of the church, and these are the committed people. These are the ones that are doing ministry according to their strengths. So again, the goal is to identify the strengths and weaknesses of each person in a local church and visitors should become regular attendees. Regular attendees should become members and members become leaders working within their spheres. Paul talked about this idea in 2 Timothy 2.2. He said, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses in trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. This is a critical verse in any local church. By the way, it's a critical verse in our ministry too. We are a leadership development ministry. We're not a counseling ministry. Uh, We put out tons of Uh, discipleship resources. Some people will call it biblical counseling resources, and that's fine. Folks will read the content that we put out, and they will come and ask for counseling, and I understand that, but we're not able to do counseling because we are a very small team doing a lot of work, and so we just don't have the human resources to do the work of counseling on a one-to-one basis, and and also it's not as effective. Biblical counseling is not as effective as discipleship. Discipleship is the historical, traditional role of the local church, and at best, biblical counseling is a subset 
of discipleship that fits up inside discipleship. And so our ministry is a discipleship training ministry that comes alongside the local church, and we want to help the local church to mature their people so that the individuals within any local church can be effective disciple makers. And so what we're doing, in essence, is trying to model what Paul was telling Timothy in 2.2, Commit to faithful men who can go out and teach others. And so the men and women who come to our ministry, we have one aim for them. And that aim is to help to develop them and to mature them so they can go back into their local churches and help their leadership by being part of that growing, maturing infrastructure, that inner core that can affect the entire dynamic of the church and, of course, the community too. An ideal situation for us is actually to uh, train a mastermind student. And so someone comes into our online program, uh, they receive the training over a period of two or three years, and then they are positioned in that local church, helping the pastors and the other leaders of the church doing, I mean, they possibly could uh, be doing biblical counseling if their gifting is that expansive to where they can do this subset of discipleship, which is formalized biblical counseling. And so what Paul is t told Timothy to do in trust to faithful people who can do likewise, we try to emulate that, even though, of course, Paul is talking to the local church, and that's why we want to come alongside the local church to help them to identify leaders and to raise them up so that they can commit to faithful men who can go out and teach others also. Now, this is also akin to the Great Commission, which you are familiar with, I'm sure, in Matthew 28. Verses 19 and 20, Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And again, in an echo kind of way, because we are not the local church at lifeovercoffee.com. And so we want to, in an echo way, emulate this as well as emulating what Paul told Timothy. And so we want to go and make disciples, but our intent is not to grow a parachurch ministry. We want to make disciples, again, to implant them in local churches so that they can come alongside their leadership and help them to equip more saints for God's glory and also for the work of evangelism. And so therefore, a key for the church leadership is to focus on leaders who are ready to go and make disciples. They need uh, the pastors and the folks at the, the top of the hierarchy within a, a local church in my view, they need to spend most of their time working with this fourth demographic, the leaders who are ready and willing and able to engage the church. They don't want to spend all of their time with the first three demographics, the visitors, the attendees, <clears throat> and the non-engaged members, because if you do that, you will not be able to build out your infrastructure. Now, what I'm sharing here actually is in line with how Jesus did ministry too. Jesus, I say it this way, he didn't feed the 5,000. The apostles fed the 5,000 as far as distributing the elements to the 5,000 people. Jesus did not do that because he was, he was just a singular individual, not capable like you and me, of ministering to so many people. And so if you look at his daytimer and his calendar allotments, he spent more time with the 12 than the masses. And if you want to develop a ministry like ours, for example, or more importantly, if you want to develop a, a local church then you have to spend more time with your infrastructure than with the masses, the visitors, the regular attendees, and the non-engaged members. Now, I'm not suggesting that the leaders ignore the needier group, this, these first three 
demographics, they don't ignore them at all. But what they do is they provide context and they provide resources for them to grow with the intent of them moving along in this maturation continuum. The fundamental principle that I operate by, and I didn't come up with this, but I have adopted it, is when I'm talking to someone, if they, if they're, if they come within our ministry radar, the question that I'm asking, though I may not ask them directly, but I'm definitely asking it in my mind. Do you want my attention or do you want my care? And that is a vital question to ask anybody that you are serving. If you are a pastor, you have to be asking this question. Because most of the people that come to a local church would love to have face time with the pastor but that is unwise because a pastor cannot give everyone his undivided attention unless he's only pastoring 15 to 20 people. Jesus pulled it off by shepherding 12 people and he gave them his undivided attention. Every now and then he would give limited attention to other people. But in almost all cases, he delegated to the, to the larger group because it's just not possible nor wise to give all your attention to the larger group. It, again, if you do that, your infrastructure will never be developed. Thus, it will eventually truncate and it will sabotage your ability to effectively build out a ministry. And so Jesus gave most of his attention to the 12. And then that small group exported the care of Jesus to the masses. And so that's why you have this, this tension, or you have these two ga categories. Do you want my attention or do you want my care? Now, again, our ministry, I follow that model. For example, I do not engage people on social media because if I did, it would consume most of my time. It would prohibit me from creating resources like what I'm doing right now. It would prohibit me from leadership development, which is our mastermind program. And so I don't give anyone on social media my attention. And I know they don't think through this and they're innocent. Uh, they're unwitting when they ask me questions. They don't realize, I mean, the general rule of thumb, depending on uh, which uh, statistics you look at when someone uh, distracts you or asks you a question, it can take anywhere from seven to 20 minutes away from the thing that you were doing. Now, again, depending on which statistic uh, you look at, will give you different numbers. But uh, every time somebody asks you a question, let's just say it takes you away from what you were doing, to get back at it and to get focused into what you're doing, it can be anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes. And so if I did that, I mean, I have, I mean, this morning within one hour, I've had uh, 15 people ask me things through various social media uh, platforms and then also our internal communication system through Slack. And every time that that happens, it takes me away. And if 15 people do that within an hour, well, 15 times 20 is 300 minutes. Well, that's more than an hour. I don't get anything done at all. And so what I have to do in order to serve the masses is I have to create context and we have to create a, a process, protocols and procedures to be able to serve them so that they can receive my care, but yet they do not receive my attention. And there are several ways that we do this. First of all, uh, mercifully, uh, through our supporting community who underwrite this ministry, uh, we are able to hire people that can help uh, to take care of some of these things that come in to us. And so we have uh, 10 or 11 people on our team, and, and they help to provide care to people, people that I will never meet and cannot meet and cannot see because I need to be focused on uh, specific things. And I can't be running around like a, uh, like a rat running through a, a maze 
because I would never get anything accomplished. And so we have protocols, we have processes, we have people in place to be able to uh, provide my care to the masses, but yet I never interact with the masses because I have to be behind the curtain producing and then focusing on that small sphere within our ministry uh, that uh, request uh, our mastermind t- uh, students, for example, that want my uh, hands-on care. Now, because of that, we can minister to 100,000 people in a week, but I only interact with you know, 30 or less people within that week. And so that is just one way that we can minister to the masses. They can receive my care through the content that we have created at lifeovercoffee.com. They can read articles, they can watch videos, they can listen to podcasts. Uh, We have hundreds and hundreds of graphics. And so there is a lot of care that they can receive. But then if they want more than just this external care, then they move down the funnel and they become supporters of our ministry. And then with supporters, uh, we have different ways of ministering to them, primarily through our private forums where now they can ask questions and I interact with them uh, on the forums by answering their questions, our team answers their questions, and of course our community is talking to each other as well. And so that is a smaller group of people. And then if those supporters want more intensive discipleship care, then they move into our mastermind program, and then that's where they get the most intense, detailed, meticulous care as we mature them into disciple makers. And so you can see the same model that I'm communicating to the local church. You have visitors, you have regular attendees, you have non-engaged members, and then you have uh, members who are engaged who are doing the work of the ministry. You see the funnel. It's very wide at the top. It gets very small at the bottom. And I recommend that pastors spend their time building out the bottom, the infrastructure where you spend most of your time, like what Jesus did, like what I just illustrated as far as our ministry model is concerned. We do not ignore the masses at all. We have free resources. It is absolutely free. There are millions of words that they can partake in. They can read on any subject pertaining to life and godliness and find a lot of benefit, but they do that on their own. And then as they move into this tighter group, the care intensifies for them. And again, this is what I recommend for the local church. Jesus could not care well for more than 12, and nor can I, and nor can you. And so you have to ask the question, do you want to be scattered like a mouse in a maze where you're just running all over the place and many times bumping your head into the wall and running into dead ends and you're just always churning but you're never accomplishing anything, Or do you want to streamline a process to where everybody that comes within your orbit can receive your care and you never turn them away? And so when a visitor comes to your local church, you have a process in place for them to receive your care but not receive your attention and they receive your care because of the context because of the individuals that you have set up so that they can receive your care through these other individuals. And so uh, if you want to think through uh, how to grow in that, and if we can serve you, then I would appeal to you uh, to reach out uh, to us and say, hey, uh, could you uh, help us to be able to streamline so that we can be able to accommodate a greater number of people without being overcome uh, by the number of people that are coming to us. Now, part of that does take courage. Uh, part of that takes the, uh, the willingness to say no to some people. When I'm asked these questions on Facebook uh, all day long, for example, or Instagram, or LinkedIn, or YouTube, 
the temptation is, is to go out there and engage these people. But I know two things would happen if I do that. One, 10 to 20 minutes of my time would be taken away. And in any hour, I lose 300 minutes of time because of the number of requests that come to me. And then number two, I will not be able to invest in those people. I become nothing more than an answer, a one-off answer person, just answering whatever question is important to them, but I would not be pouring into them. Where I want to spend my time is creating uh, world-class content that is evergreen, and so it lasts forever. And then I want to pour into people who are reciprocating with me on a daily and weekly basis. And so I can pour into them. These are not one-off conversations where I'm just asking a, uh, answering a question that was wafting through somebody's mind because they read something from uh, one of our resources on social media. I can't spend my time doing that. But if I have a reciprocal relationship with a, a person who is committed to our ministry in the Mastermind program, I know that I can pour into that individual and it's going to have generational impact on people's lives. And so what I'm producing is generational resources, whether it's through a read, watch, listen content or people that we replicate. When God takes me home, when my time comes to die, these two people, these two, uh, con these two things that I've developed here, whether it's content or individuals, it will be here to stay, and it will continue in a replicating format, following what Timothy was talking about in two two, commit to faithful people who can teach others. Likewise, my goal is to continue to be developing leaders long after I am dead. And you can do that if you focus on this infrastructure and build them out. But if you spend all your days just running around social media for a ministry like mine or running around trying to put out fires in a local church as a firefighter versus doing the preventative work, uh, then you're not going to really get anything accomplished. You're just going to be everybody's babysitter or, or, or uh, God's answer man for these people, but you're not going to be ultimately pouring into them because they haven't committed to you. And so the commitment that you make to any individual has to be in proportion to their commitment to you. And so if we can help you with these things, we would love to. I want to give you a couple of ideas before I wrap up here. One is we develop leaders through our mastermind program. And so as a local church, as a pastor, if you had someone that you have identified and you're as busy as you can be, uh, I pastored for uh, five years and uh, people ask me, how did that go? Uh, well, part of my answer is I never had a day off in five years. I mean, even though we had a day off every Monday, it was never a day off. Pastors do not get a day off. I mean, you're constantly caring uh, the weight of the people on your heart. And, and problems don't take a day off, even though you do. And so I know that you pastors, you're just as busy as you can possibly be. And so one of the ways that we can serve you is if you have an identified person, I would recommend that you scholarship them. This person is a proven leader and we want you to develop them through your mastermind program over two or three years and, and we will pay their tuition and we will hold them accountable for doing the work. What would you get at the end? Well, at the end, what you would get is a highly developed disciple maker in proportion to the gifting that they have. Now, of course, everybody has a ceiling, but one of the things that we would do is identify the ceiling of that individual. Uh, you may have a person who can only function within a limited sphere because they have a limited ceiling, and that is fine. You may have a high-capacity person who could actually be a formalized biblical counselor. Well, that is great, too, but we help to identify that. And then, of course, you'll have a person who may have a high ceiling, but yet operating within a smaller sphere because they haven't gotten the, rep the, rep the repetitions in at this point because it takes, as Malcolm Gladwell would say, 10,000 hours to become proficient in any discipline. And that is true. It takes a long time. Training doesn't make you proficient. Training is just a good start. Uh, it takes a long time to be, become proficient. And so uh, we can 
give them the tools that they need and we can develop them uh, through the mastermind program, then put them in a context where they can continue to grow through repetition of their discipline and become more and more proficient as the years go by. And so if you have an individual that you have identified and you want us to come alongside to help you, uh, in part because you're busy, but in part also we can really focus uh, on the individual because as a pastor, your focus is so broad. Uh, You're interacting with so many different things. You're wearing 47 different hats. And so we would be glad to develop this person for you. And then you get a highly developed, trained individual in your local church. Now, the beauty for me is, is that your local church would receive my care through this person that I develop. And that is a wonderful thing that just brings me no greater joy to know uh, that people that I will never meet will receive my care through the people that we plant in these local churches. And so that's one option. Another option is we can provide free resources for your church. Uh, You could tell your church on Sunday morning, like, here is a website that we have vetted, we believe in. It's lifeovercoffee.com. They have a search feature in the upper right-hand corner, and you just type in your word, your phrase, uh, the thing that you're searching for, and you'll find world-class discipleship Uh, resources, all things pertaining to life and godliness. And if you have marriage problems, parenting problems, insecurity problems, whatever issue, addiction issues, whatever the struggle is, they have resources that speak speak to it. And this is a free service. And so we want you to take advantage of lifeovercoffee.com. And so what you can do is share our ministry to your folks and then let us work for you behind the scenes. Uh, Like white noise is going on all the time behind the scenes because you've shared our ministry. So we can train directly and then we can train passively as you share our ministry with your local church. And then a third option would be to pull down specific resources and, and have your small groups go through them or Uh, It can be an equipping resource for a counseling ministry if you have that. But there are several different ways. And if you want more ideas, just reach out to us and ask. This is episode 457, an effective equipping model for the church. And the equipping model is to move people from visitors to regular attendees to non-engaged members to identifying their strengths and weaknesses and putting them in the proper niche where they are working within their strengths. And that's the fourth level where you have a, uh, you're building out your infrastructure of the local church. And if we can help you in this process, we would love to do this. Uh, we'd love to come, come alongside identified leaders and serve your local church. And if you'd like to talk about this, then I would love for you as a pastor to reach out to me specifically, and we can get on a Zoom call and we can talk about some specifics to your uh, unique local church. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, Episode 457, an effective equipping model for the church. Thanks for joining us. Learn more and get access to other resources at lifeovercoffee.com.